I'm Brendan Clark. Welcome again to Philosophy of Medicine. Uh, today we're going to be talking for the second time about discovery. Uh, last time we basically looked at a case, the case of Burkitt's lymphoma, which I think is a really interesting example of discovery in medicine. Um, today we're going to think a bit about what philosophers have said about discovery. Um, and this is with particular reference to two uh, bits of philosophical writing, which is the 1962 paper by Thomas Kuhn um, and the 1960 paper by, by Norwood Russell Hansen. Um, both of those should be linked below, and if you're a UCL student, you can find them on Moodle and in the reading list. Um, but while these two papers are, are different and work in different ways, they're both in one way or another, intending to make a related point uh, to each other, which is that discovery is important for philosophers. Now, that might sound so obvious as to not be worth saying. Um, so actually, at least part of this lecture is to try and flesh out a bit why it is that about 50 years ago, philosophers of science had to actually <laughs> argue with people um, about why we should think about discovery at all. Okay, and to do that, what we're going to do is is by is to start off with the kind of uh, exemplary story, or I suppose really myth about discovery. Um, and this is um, well, this is the, the 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 I suppose anecdote about Archimedes. Um, Archimedes was interested in determining the method, uh, determining a method for uh, finding out the volume of an object with with an irregular shape. So actually, I mean, the the traditional kind of stories about Archimedes working with a crown. Um, I don't have a crown here, um, for for reasons that have a lot to do with the, the the pay of academic staff. But what I what I've got is this this peculiarly shaped bit of. Uh, aluminium that I picked off the, the floor of a massive aluminium smelting works, which is a kind of interesting story in its own right. But anyway, how do you figure out the volume of something like this? Well, Archimedes um, um, apocryphally um, pondered this, this kind of question with relation to a crown. And the reason that that was important was that this crown apparently belonged to uh, a king, King Hara II. Uh, who'd supplied a goldsmith with pure gold to be made into a crown. Um, however, the king was suffering from, from uh, some species of regal paranoia uh, and was worried that, in fact, the, the goldsmith had substituted something a little bit less expensive and deluxe than gold lead, for example, in the making of this crown. Um, uh, actually, I think it's silver, but my my uh, my knowledge of, of this kind of thing is, is a bit shaky, unfortunately. Anyway, the idea is that Archimedes had to figure out the volume of a crown in order to figure out whether some um, <coughs> dishonest substitution of materials has occurred in its making. This was taxing to him, and he he, he had uh, some hard period of work trying to figure out how to how to to estimate the volume of this irregular shape. Um, and in fact, it wasn't until he was trying to relax, wash away the day's labours with a, with a hot bath that the answer came. And, and the story is supposedly that Archimedes sits down in his bath, as this, uh, this woodcut demonstrates. Um, the level of the bath goes up. Archimedes realises that it's his displacement of water by his body that's, that's pushing this volume of water out. Um, and that's providing a way of estimating the volume of of an irregular object, right? You displace it in water, see how much, you, you put it in water, you see how much water is displaced by the object, and that tells you the volume of the irregular shape thing. The story goes anyway that Archimedes is, is so impressed by his own uh, own discovery that he uh, he shouts the word Eureka, um, I have found it, and uh, in some versions legs it out of the bath uh, down the street um, in uh, a state of nature. Now, I, I don't know whether we should take this kind of story seriously. I, I don't know what the evidence is. I'm, I'm not a historian of, of that kind of period. What we should take seriously, though, is the kind of impact that this myth has, right? Because actually this, this story seems to give us an idea about discovery, right? Discovery is probably something that's pretty well momentary, right? There's no kind of process. There's, well, at least in the myth, there's no sense of a process for Archimedes, right? It just sort of happens. It's a, a light bulb moment. Um, 
And this kind of idea that discovery is just something, well, irrational and psychological that happens inside an individual's head is a really important one for philosophers of science because it's, it's quite often what they said they believed. Now, <clears throat> the reason that this is important is that it takes discovery uh, outside the context of things that philosophers, particularly philosophers who uh, used logic as a tool of analysis, um, it took discovery out of the realm of things that they could deal with. Um, and in fact, the, the logical empiricists, the, the primarily English-speaking philosophers of the 1950s, 60s, um, that followed the Vienna Circle, tended to distinguish two phases of scientific work, right? They talked first of the context of discovery, right? The period of scientific creativity, where scientists come up with new ideas, like, I suppose in this case, displacement. Um, and then the more logical, less creative, the rational period of justification, of, of deciding whether those ideas were good ones, right? And it was this, this second period, this, this, uh, this context of justification that uh, philosophers in the logical empiricist tradition concentrated on because it was amenable, basically, to, to investigation with logic. Um, so both the accounts from uh, Kuhn and from Hansen um, are arguments that intend to, in some way, disrupt this distinction between discovery as the kind of thing that philosophers shouldn't properly engage with um, and justification as the kind of thing that philosophers should work on. Both, both accounts are intended to disrupt that in one way or another. So with that kind of preamble in place, and remember that there are some there's supporting materials for UCL students um, available that, that, that can give you more to go on if, if you're interested in these topics, we'll get on with talking about um, these two accounts of discovery. So Kuhn begins um, his article with a kind of short review, I suppose, of this m traditional model of discovery, like the Archimedes story. And he characterised this as being um, the, the, the um, <clears throat> view that discoveries are simple point events, right, that happen all at once that don't have an internal logical structure, right? Archimedes doesn't sit there and reason and, and, and think through. It just kind of happens in his head. Um, he begins with this kind of traditional point of view of discovery um, and says that, well, because we have this kind of view, um, it means that, that historians particularly um, have spent quite a lot of time trying to think about when and where exactly, precisely, specifically, particular discoveries occur, right? Historians work to determine what man, 1962, my apologies, uh, determine what man made which discovery at what point in time. Um, and the reason that historians spend all this time and effort finding out who did what when is that discoveries are useful, thinking, you know, uh, they're useful because if you know who discovered something, you know who should who things should be attributed to. Um, you can settle like priority disputes. I mean, the, the the very common case of very similar discoveries being made by different people at more or less the same time. You know, this is the kind of thing that historians have liked to to investigate. Um, and discoveries come with prestige. That's so obvious, nearly is to be not worth saying. But I mean, if nothing else, look at look at things like the Nobel Prize. These are made for discoveries, um, and they're well worth having. <laughs> they're well worth having for for the working scientist. Um, Kuhn's examples, though, that, that he talks about, are drawn from the physical sciences, or well, discovery of oxygen, um, and also from from biology. So there's this famous priority dispute between um, uh, Wallace and Darwin. But he's, he kind of leads, leads into this with a question, you know, when, when shall we say that oxygen was discovered and what criteria shall we use in answering that question? Um, and he then starts actually putting together some very nice kind of arguments against this way of thinking. So he says, well, what criteria should we say that somebody um, discovered something? Should we 
say that the first time that somebody holds a sample of oxygen in their hands, like I suppose as I'm doing now with an impure sample moment from, from my kitchen room air, um, should we say that the first person to hold oxygen in their hand discovered it? Well, no, we probably wouldn't. Um, should we say that the first person to have manufactured a pure sample of oxygen, un unintentionally or intentionally, sh should be, you know, have discovered it? Well, don't know, some of us might, some of us might not. Um, or should we go for something a bit more ambitious, you know, knowing that you've discovered oxygen, as you discover oxygen, you know, doing some chemical procedure, finding, finding that you have a pure sample of oxygen, saying, aha, I have discovered oxygen. Um, it's vague, right? It's vague. The, how, aware the, how aware the discoverer is of what they've done is, is kind of very vague. Um, and actually, we can find this out if we go and look at the kind of uh, historical work on discovery. We can find actually that it's extremely hard to precisely pinpoint when discoveries happen. Now, if you need another example, and he will introduce some, some of the course materials, we can think about the case of Burkitt's lymphoma from the last lecture, right? There are lots and lots and lots of bits of this discovery that may be the very first um, kind of clinical description of Burkitt's lymphoma, or this kind of clinical unification, right? Figuring out that all of the cases of this tumour seem to be caused by a very similar looking tumour, histologically speaking, or histopathologically speaking, my apologies. Um, or maybe it's when you do the geography thing and realise there's a big belt across uh, across equatorial Africa where um, this tumour syndrome happens or whatnot, right? It's, it's hard to figure out precisely what the thing is that we want to call a discovery. Um, so Kuhn asked them what, what criteria we should use to figure out what, what, what discoveries are. Is it just running into something and encountering, you know, have I discovered aluminium? Well, no, I haven't. Uh, is it isolating or describing the thing, or is it finding out how the thing works, or is it, is it kind of something else? That's the puzzle about discovery. We then move on to kind of uh, Kuhn's more positive argument, which is that he claims that it's generally pretty well inappropriate to actually try and find out when a particular discovery happened and who made it, right? Um, and the reason for this being the case is that Kuhn argues that nearly all discoveries are extended, right? They happen over time involving usually multiple people, multiple places. They are historical processes. Um, it's like the kind of category mistake that you might make by saying, well, when was the Second World War? Well, there is a when, but it's a range. And actually the range slightly depends on who you ask, right? Historians date the beginning of the Second World War at, at sort of various points. There, there are various conflicts in the 20s and, and even back into the kind of 19... In, sorry, in the 30s and even back into the 1920s that some historians suggest really represent the beginning of the conflict. Um, now, I said then that, that this is nearly all discoveries, and actually Kuhn makes a distinction between simple and troublesome discoveries. I don't really want to talk about that here because I think it's confusing. Um, but let me just see if I can try and deal with it in, in 20 seconds or so. So nearly all discoveries are troublesome ones. Like the Burkitt's lymphoma case, that's an example of a troublesome discovery because... Um, you don't know really what you've discovered when you discover it. So Burkitt didn't know when he started finding children with, with facial swellings that this was going to be um, a, a, an extra nodal B cell lymphoma, right? Um, there are, Kuhn suggests, occasional cases where discoveries are simple, right? Uh, and this is characterised by, by cases where when you discover something, you know what it is you've discovered. And they're pretty rare. They're pretty rare, I think, in most places. The kind of examples that he's talking about are, for example, the discovery of new elements that were predicted by gaps in the periodic table. And there are, some, there are a couple of examples of these where, where something was discovered that had been predicted by, by the periodic table and researchers had a good idea of what its likely properties were going to be and so on before they found it. So they could, they could pick it up and say, I oh, know this is what I mean, but they could pick it up and say, well, oh, I've discovered germanium or, or something similar. So we're not really going to talk about those for the rest of this. We're going to talk about troublesome discoveries, which are nearly all discoveries. 
And Kuhn suggests that these things are extended in time, they involve multiple people, may happen in multiple places. And they're characterised by a difference between discovering that something is and discovering what that something is. Okay. Um, so the kind of nice examples are um, like this. So imagine that, that you are a member of an uncontacted group living in the wild somewhere. Uh, and an explorer show, shows up in a, a, actually a rather nice uh, battered looking Land Rover um, or Jeep. You can, of course, see this thing, right? You, you can see um, that there's a big green thing there with, with people in it who are trying to make friends with you. Um, but it's probably not really right to say that you can see that they've come in a Jeep, right? You, there's something there. <laughs> but you don't know that it's a Jeep or, or a Land Rover. Um, we know that because we've got previous experience and all the rest of it. Well, the same with discovery very often, right? You can discover something, you can see something, you can see some new unexpected thing happen without at once knowing what it is that's happened. Um, this is a kind of way into Kuhn's argument then. So there's a difference between discovering something, you know, discovering this this unexpected piece of piece of aluminium and then and actually figuring out what exactly it is. And Kuhn kind of gives us some, some theory to go on here. He, he sort of breaks down the process of discovery into, into three stages that try and make sense of why there's a difference between discovering something and discovering that something. You know, you know. Um, which go like this. So discoveries typically, Kuhn says, work like this. First of all, an anomaly happens. Right? An anomaly, Kuhn says, is, is nature's failure to conform entirely to uh, expectations. If you're a bit less eloquent than Kuhn, like, like me, <laughs> you'd say that, well, something weird happens. Um, in the Burkitt's lymphoma case, the, the kind of example that we're thinking of here is Burkitt realising that there are lots and lots of children with strange facial swellings coming to his, uh, his bit of the clinic, right? Um, but we can think across, the, across different sciences of different ways that we might produce anomalies. Um, and, uh, the, I mean, the, the interesting and kind of substantive bit of this is that quite often you need to have particular conditions in place to notice anomalies. So I think the Burton's lymphoma case, actually, the anomaly required kind of record-keeping, it required surveillance, it required there to be people in place actually kind of collecting data and looking, looking at children. Um, so, so, so Kuhn kind of, kind of makes this point, which I mean, is of interest, but probably too involved to get into much here. But so there, there is kind of a backstory about how you produce anomalies, how you figure out that nature isn't doing what it's supposed to do. Well, obviously, you need to know a bit about what nature is supposed to do. Um, anyway, once you've found an anomaly and you've been lucky or fortunate or clever enough to recognise that it's an anomaly, um, there's then a second phase of discovery where you basically try and make sense of that anomaly. You make them, as Kuhn says, behave. And he talks about uh, a period, a more or less extended period, during which the individual and, and many members of his group, and sorry for the gendering of this again, of his group struggle to make the anomaly law-like. That is, to, to behave and, and to be comprehensible in a scientific way. For, for us, the analogy here, or the kind of comparison here, is maybe some of the geographical work in the Burkitt's lymphoma story, right? You do, con you continue work, you, you, and you try and make sense of what's going on um, in such a way that you can connect what's, what, what has caused your anomaly to take place, or what, what your anomaly is, with other related scientific things that you, you know of. And this might be quite a complicated program, actually. I mean, it might involve you, for example, revising your expectations about other scientific things. And this certainly happens in the Burkitt's lymphoma case, although um, um, it would probably require us uh, to make this lecture about 16 hours long to go into, into detail. But the idea is that, that, it, that understanding anomalies can be a really kind of complicated, involved business that might involve you um, radically changing your ideas about other kinds of scientific things. And then there's a third stage for Kuhn, which I suppose is the kind of continuation of this. He characterises it as adjustment, adaptation and assimilation, or the aftermath of discovery. 
Um, and here the argument is one that's related to work that Kuhn's much more famous for, which is his work on scientific revolutions. Um, so he suggests that troublesome discoveries are not simply additions uh, to some kind of hypothetical store of total knowledge, right? Discovering new things can change your way of understanding old things. They are discoveries are rather grander and greater than just kind of simple facts. Um, they might, as Kuhn suggests, you know, provide us a new view of some previously familiar object, or they might uh, change the way that scientific practice happens. They might give you new instruments or concepts or whatnot. Um, and that's very strongly related to Kuhn's ideas about scientific revolutions. Um, that's quite well known, I think, and, and discussed certainly for the UCL students in lots of other places. So I don't really, I don't really want to kind of get in that here, other than say that this work on discovery for Kuhn is, I think, of a piece with his more famous work about the structure of scientific revolutions. Anyway, the upshot is that discoveries, troublesome discoveries for emphasis, happen in this way with a proper kind of internal structure. So Kuhn talks about these, the three phases and anomaly recognition and then the, the way that anomalies are made to behave and then the way that other scientific things are adjusted and fitted around these new discoveries. All of this takes time, right? Kuhn says, there's no single moment or day which a historian, however complete his data, can identify as the point at which the discovery was made. Often when several individuals are involved, it's even impossible, I mean, impo impossibly unequip, excuse me, often when several individuals are involved, it's even impossible unequivocally to identify any one of them as the discoverer. Um, so actually understanding how discoveries work might well complicate our, as historians or as philosophers, our, our use of the concept of discovery. Um, I think that's probably enough on Kuhn. That's uh, fif fifteen or so minutes worth. I, I really recommend reading it. Actually, it's um, if, if you have if you have the ability to access it, and you're not paywalled out. It's a very short paper, and it's meant for a very general audience. I, I really would recommend uh, would recommend having a look at it if you possibly can. Anyway, that's the end of our first kind of philosopher on discovery. Um, we're going to move on to our second right now, uh, which is Norwood Russell Hansen. So Hansen's view of discoveries is about the logic of scientific discovery. Those of you that were listening, listening to the, the earlier section that dealt with the context distinction might be surprised by this. Um, and I think I was quite surprised by this the first time I, I read this, uh, this kind of paper. Um, but just to recapitulate very, very quickly, um, discovery was typically not considered very important by many philosophers of science and the logical empiricist tradition. Uh, because it wasn't really amenable to logical analysis, right? It was something that happened in people's heads. Um, and Hansen's paper attempts to try and to try and break that um, by suggesting that at least there are ways that philosophers can make sense of discovery in a logical way. He's trying to suggest that that far from being something that that philosophers who like logic. Um, Sorry, far from discovery being something that philosophers who like logic are unable to work, work on, actually there are ways of coming to grips, logically speaking, with discovery. And actually his, his idea is very simple. Um, say you, have, uh, you encounter some new surprising thing. Um, and here you might think, actually quite closely related I think, you might uh, remember kind of Kuhn's idea about, about anomalies. Anyway, imagine you encounter some surprising or astonishing phenomenon. Um, now here's, here's the kind of slightly more complicated bit. These phenomena, Hansen argues, wouldn't be surprising were some hypothesis of some kind to obtain, right? That is, imagine that you have some hypothesis that can explain these surprising phenomena. So for the Burkitt's lymphoma case, our, our hypothesis might be Oh, perhaps all these children, that's our surprising phenomenon with facial swelling, right? Um, perhaps there's some kind of disease they all have. That might be an example of the hypothesis we have. That maybe this is all caused by one disease um, that in some way causes facial swelling. Well, then our surprising phenomenon wouldn't really be surprising anymore. In fact, they would follow from something like this hypothesis and they'd be explained by it. 
So some disease happens in equatorial Africa that doesn't happen in the United Kingdom. And this disease has clinical features that are consistent with the clinical features seen in the, in the many children that, that came into the clinics that, that Birkin was working in. Um, thus, this hypothesis explains these phenomena. They, they follow from it. Um, and then the third part of Hansen's argument is to say that, well, actually, then there is very good reason for elaborating your hypothesis, your age, uh, for proposing it as a possible hypothesis from whose assumption um, our phenomena might be explained. Now, I suppose it's not the greatest argument in the world. In fact, when, when, you, uh, when, you, when you try and explain it like this, I'm always surprised by how kind of obvious it sounds, right? Well, um, you know, we, we can make sense of a dis discovery by thinking of, you know, what is surprising about a particular discovery well, imagine that we had some um, nice scientific hypothesis that explained those surprising things. Um, well, those things wouldn't be surprising anymore. <laughs> I mean, that is uh, extremely schematically, of course, but quite a nice, succinct version of what a discovery is. Um, and yet it's, it's cast in these logical terms that in 1960 made it, made it very... Um, kind of radical sounding, I think. This was proper work using logic. Um, that dealt with something that had, in general, been regarded as being not amenable to logical analysis. And actually, Hansen, in a, um, a slightly earlier paper about discovery, had given this very nice quote. Um, which is, I think, it was intended really to try and uh, act as a bit of a call to arms, I suppose. And it goes like this. Um, More philosophers must venture into these unexplored regions in which the logical issues are often hidden by the specialist work of historians, psychologists, and the scientists themselves. We must attend as much to how scientific hypotheses are caught as to how they're cooked. <laughs> there is a nice, uh, a nice kind of uh, a fishing metaphor for you at the end. Um, the idea is then that, that maybe, according to Hansen, people who, who, who maintain the context distinction, who tend to ignore discovery, had just sort of missed a trick, right? They, they'd missed processes that were properly logical, um, that were kind of hiding in the details, that were hiding in the complexities of, of, uh, of careful historical work on, on discovery. So anyway, that's, that's the end of, of this uh, much shorter and, and second uh, philo philosophical work on, uh, on discovery. Um, definitely worth thinking about how both of those fit together with the, the kind of Berkeston phone case in the previous, um, the previous uh, um, lecture. Anyway, uh, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, very, uh, very keen indeed to read any questions or comments that you might have below. All right, I've been Brendan Clark, and uh, thanks very much indeed. Bye.